Oh, good evening. Please take your seat. Thank you. <laughs> Let me back up. Good evening. Please take someone else's seat. <laughs> You're going to have to uh, prove that that is a legitimate act, though, and I doubt whether you can do that in just a few seconds. Thank you and welcome to the UNCG campus. My name is Sterling Vanderwerker. I will be moderating the debate answering the question, does the Christian God exist? This debate is sponsored by the UNC atheists, agnostics, and skeptics who have invited Shepherd's Fellowship Sovereign Grace Baptist Church to debate the question. We have just uh, 30 seconds for each side to make some announcements concerning their organizations. So, Mr. Rob Eldridge, go ahead. Hey, I'm Robert Eldridge. I'm president of the UNC atheists, agnostics, and skeptics. Um, we have meetings every Friday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Usually they're in the EUC, uh, Phillips, in the Phillips room in the EUC. One thing to keep in mind though is we don't have a meeting next Friday night, or tomorrow night, because of Labor Day on Monday. And our next meeting on September 10th will be in the Dogwood room if anyone's interested in coming out. Our next event, yeah, and it's all on here. Our next event is going to be um, Michael Lackey. He's a, a professor from the University of Minnesota at uh, Morris. He's going to be speaking on the making of Hitler and the Nazis, a tale of modern secularism or, or Christian idealism. So that promises to be uh, uh, interesting, at least. And uh, we're going to be passing out these debate, these uh, index cards. Well, do you want to? I'll cover that in just a moment. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll talk about Pastor that. Dustin, do you have an opportunity for an announcement? I'm a pastor, one of the pastors of Shepherd's Fellowship of Greensboro Baptist Church. Uh, some of you who have seen me on campus doing open air preaching are probably familiar with my voice. Um, I'm going to have to yell at you again tonight. We don't have microphones, but if you want to check us out on the web, go to graceinthetriad.com or graceinthetriad.blogspot.com. Thank you. First, a few safety and My website is one up here. I'm making their own introduction. Uh, first, a few safety instructions. Obviously, there's concern uh, with this many people in the room. We are not counting because it's posted for 49 people. <laughs> okay. In the event of a fire, exits are clearly marked. You'll be able to find your way out of the building. And for those of you who are traveling uh, with young children, you'll need to be sure that you can meet in the gallery parking lot. So that is at the rear of the building toward the southeast, east southeast from this building. Second, please, we have a capacity crowd in attendance. It will be very difficult to hear. I'm probably the loudest of the speakers. So please remain seated until the break midway through the debate. If you need to use the facilities, Will everyone around them please accommodate them? There are obvious consequences. <laughs> please silence all cell phones now. I'll take about 10 seconds so that you might be able to uh, grab your cell phone. You may silence them, please. If you carry a pager, you are out of date, please silence them. <laughs> and for personal digital assistants or robots, please silence those. Third, the vast majority of you received a handout. <clears throat> there are rules of conduct for the audience. Please, in order for the question to be answered by the debaters, it is essential that the audience remain quiet until the conclusion of the debate. This provides no distractions to either the affirmative or to the negative and permits the entire audience to concentrate on the most important thing. That is their determination on who prevails in the question. The debaters respect, uh, request respectful conduct and the moderator will stop the debate in order to maintain a collegiate air of respect and discipline. We will permit no profanity or outburst, please, and we will stop the debate until such time you have been removed from the room. Fourth, you've been supplied with a 3 by 5 index card for questions, which will be collected at the break. If you will bring those up here, this uh, uh, trash can will not be used as a trash can. It will be a depository for your questions. Please write clearly. 
It's important that your question be limited to reading less than 30 seconds. Fourth, we've supplied you with an information sheet containing the schedule and rules and the curriculum vitae for each participant. As a result, I will not make introductions other than the debater's first and last names. Please open your program now or turn it over if it's face down. And I as I introduce to you the members of the UNCG Atheists, Agnostics, and Skeptics who will answer the questions in the negative. This is Mr. Joshua Deaton and Mr. Philip Drum. And now, answering the question in the positive, the debaters from Shepherd's Fellowship, Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, Pastor Dustin Seegers and Mr. Cy Tenberg and Kate. If you are able, please be seated and gentlemen, prepare to answer the following question in the affirmative. Does the Christian God exist? You may begin. Well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you. I want to thank the UNCG atheists, agnostics, and skeptics for inviting us to participate in this most important debate. Tonight, we'll begin our presentation by noting that we'll not be defending a generic theism, but instead we'll be defending Christian theism as solely grounded in Scripture. So we're not interested in debating gods we don't believe in. We don't believe in a flying spaghetti monster. We don't believe in the invisible pink unicorn. And we'll stand right beside you and laugh and critique them as well. We're going to use a Christ-centered method that defends the view that God is the ultimate authority over all aspects of life, what is known as a worldview apologetic. Let's get into some definitions. Since our opponents tonight are naturalists, it will be important to define what that is. Naturalism denies that there are any spiritual or supernatural realities. There are, that is, no purely mental substances and there are no supernatural realities transcendent to the world, or at least we have no sound grounds for believing that there are such realities, or perhaps even for believing that there could be such realities. It is the view that anything that exists is ultimately made up of physical components. Here's a lowdown on what that means. Nature is all there is. There are no spiritual realms. There's no immaterial entities or realities. Carl Sagan probably summed it up best when he said, the cosmos is all there is, all there ever was, and all there ever will be. Now, it's important to note tonight that this debate is not about facts, but instead about one's interpretation of the facts. Any interpretation of any fact or experience is informed by one's assumptions about reality, what we call presuppositions. These are those rock-bottom foundational beliefs that all people have that are not testable in a science lab and aren't observed in nature. These presuppositions form the foundation of a person's worldview, that being defined as a network of presuppositions through which every aspect of man's knowledge and experience is interpreted and interrelated. People's presuppositions determine how they interpret and evaluate every experience and which ideas they will and will not accept as part of their overall view of reality. The following quote from atheist Richard Lewontin demonstrates the power of presuppositions. Quote, Materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now why would an atheist say that? Well, let's read the rest of the quote to get some more context. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Here's a summary of what that guy said. Even if God's the answer, we're not going to allow it. Now, as Christians, we demonstrate that things like knowledge and proof make sense in the Christian worldview, given our presuppositions, but they don't make sense in the naturalist worldview, given theirs. Regarding faith, we take the view that biblical faith is not a blind leap into an irrational void, nor is it opposed to reason. It doesn't take over where reason leaves off, but instead faith in God is the foundation of all reasoning. Hebrews 11.1 1 defines Christian faith as being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. This doesn't apply to just Christian reasoning, but atheistic reasoning has its own kind of faith too, since everyone begins with presuppositions that are not testable through the procedures of natural science. Since God is ultimately the foundation of all knowledge and unbelievers actually do know things, it follows that they actually do know God in some sense but are suppressing the truth about Him. Romans chapter 1 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men 
who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they didn't honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became...